foam fountain pen uh, for Hound of the Baskervilles. And it was, uh, <laughs> as the young lady who was in charge kept telling me, she said, Barry, no drooling on the artifacts. <laughs> I know in a lot of episodes for Bailey the Bookman that we talk a lot about this guy, <laughs> one of my favorites. Um, and if you've seen any of the episodes that uh, that I've done in the past, you know I, I do reference uh, Sherlock here quite a bit and we look at some of the books and so on and so forth. So today I would like to share with you uh, some of my collection which I have been working on uh, and collecting since I was 13 years old. Yeah, going on almost 15 to 20 years. So in the summer of, I'm not sure, I think it was 1969, might have been 1968, it was a while ago. Um, we had just moved to a new house. Um, summer holidays were just starting. Um, it's gonna be starting uh, elementary, not elementary, uh, junior high school. Uh, so it's kind of one of those pivotal summers. Um, didn't have a lot of, you know, close friends because we just moved. Um, and I stumbled onto this book. And you know, I can't even remember exactly uh, how I came across it. I know it was in my mom and dad's house. And anyways, I picked it up. And of course, you know, I'd heard of Sherlock Holmes, kind of, sorta. Uh, not really on the radar of a 13 year old, but picked it up, um, I don't know, I'll give it a try and, uh, and read some of it. Well, it was a, uh, I don't know, I guess a, kind of a turning point for me uh, in terms of uh, finding a passion. And uh, boy, I'm glad I, I picked this book up. You know, so as, as luck would have it, um, A Study in Scarlet is the first time that Sherlock Holmes appears in print. Um, it was published in Beaton's Christmas Annual of 1887. So who is Sherlock Holmes? Well, he is fictional. <laughs> Although there's been a lot of debate, there's a lot of Sherlockians that will argue with you that he really did exist. And that the debate goes on to this day. Um, he was created by uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, who later became Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And Doyle was uh, Scottish by heritage uh, and uh, was, uh, let's see, he went to medical school when, uh, in Glasgow, I believe, when he was about 17 years old. Uh, and studied there to be a doctor uh, under Dr. Joseph Bell, who we will talk about later. But uh, Doyle really created the prototype for the modern, you know, mastermind detective, smarter than everybody else, certainly smarter than the uh, local constabulary and uh, Scotland Yard. <laughs> so he often made fun of in the books. Um, so it was the Beaton's Christmas Annual, 1887. And uh, those were uh, like kind of pulp magazine type publications that were uh, serialized or stories came out in installation so you buy the next magazine. Um, it was first published in book form uh, in July 1988 by Ward Lock and Company, uh, an English publisher, and uh, featured drawings by um, Doyle's father, uh, Charles Doyle. Um, and those are very uh, hard to come by. There's not many that have uh, really survived that. Um, the second edition appeared the following year, uh, illustrated by George Hutchinson. Uh, not really one of the very well-known illustrators of uh, the Holmes canon. Um, and then another year later in 1890, uh, J.B. Lippincott and Company released the first American version. And of course, since then, there has been numerous uh, printings and versions and editions, and uh, actually has never gone out of print. So as the world's first consulting detective, as Holmes called himself, 
Uh, he pursued criminals throughout Victorian and Edwardian London and uh, throughout Europe. Um, some of the stories even take place in America. Um, and he wasn't really the, Holmes wasn't the very, very first detective. Edgar Allan Poe, uh, Auguste Dupin and Emile Gabriel uh, all created detectives, but Holmes made a real impact upon you know, the imagination of the reading public and uh, probably has been the most enduring character uh, of the detective story to this day. These are some of the uh, other illustrations that Doyle's father, Charles Altamont Doyle, uh, created. And uh, some of them are different. Um, I don't know, you know, the butterfly and... Uh, and he did some really some odd sorts of illustrations and as it turned out um, Doyle's father had uh, suffered from uh, a fairly severe mental illness and uh, kind of died a very sad life um, which is, you know, unfortunate, but certainly was a talented artist. But uh, as his mental illness kind of took over, some of his uh, some of his artwork got, you know, a little a little different, unusual. So as luck would have it, I found. Um, this book called the Doyle Di Doyle Diary, the last great Conan Doyle mystery, which is a uh, strange and curious case of Charles Altamont Doyle. So the very same summer that I, uh, I discovered Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes and Watson in uh, Victorian London, which is a very cool place to be. Uh, I came across a, an article in the Edmonton Journal and this fellow postulated that Sherlock Holmes was actually a woman. Yeah, I know, right? And, uh, and uh, <laughs> wrote this article in the journal that I came across and uh, the headline was Shirley Locke Jones, a Holmes, Shirley Locke Holmes. And I was outraged. Uh, so again, I was like, I don't know, 13 or 14 at the time. Uh, and I was so outraged that I had to write a letter to the editor disputing this fellow's claims that dear Sherlock was actually a woman. Uh, here, I'll show, I'll show you a little bit of it. So it's entitled Holmes Defender. And this is a photocopy. I don't know what happened to the actual letter that I, I cut out of the, the paper, but... Here it is, uh, you know, just saying uh, what an avid reader I am and how I took offense and um, just go through all of the points that uh, disputing this gentleman's uh, points in favor of uh, uh, postulating that Holmes was a woman and destroying him. So it goes on through to all of these these different points that would make it obviously impossible. And then we say at the very end, there's one fact Mr. Davies fails to bring to light. Holmes and Watson like to indulge in an occasional Turkish bath. Some very interesting problems could possibly arise from a woman accompanying Dr. Watson into such a bath. Ah, uh, but no problem at all. Shirley Locke, a most disgusting form of such a hallowed name. Shirley Locke Holmes is a master of disguise. There you go. Barry M. Bailey, Roslyn. <laughs> you know, so so further further to that idea that uh, Sherlock Holmes was a woman. Uh, my wife's parents lived in uh, in Saskatoon for many years, and we would often, you know, take that quick five hour drive uh, to that beautiful little city in the in the middle of Saskatchewan. Um, and when I was there, of course, I would visit all the bookstores and the thrift stores and garage sales and so on and so forth. Uh, so I'm looking through the thrift store there in Saskatoon one, uh, one morning, Saturday morning, and uh, I came across this book. And 
Yeah, it's more um, ideas that Sherlock was actually a woman. So the title of it is Ms. Holmes of Baker Street, The Truth About Sherlock, uh, written by C. Allen Bradley and William A. S. Sargent. So I pull this out. I'd never seen it before. I start looking through it. I'm you know, a little older, a little wiser. I'm kind of amused. And I, thought, oh, I have to look at this and just see why they think. And I mean, it's it's a, kind of a scholarly tomb when a tome when you look through it. And they, you know, they cite their uh, sources and quotes and so on and so forth. And uh, so, of course, and luckily for me, it's signed by both authors, don't you know? And then I look at the publishing information and uh, lo and behold, um, one of the authors uh, lives in Saskatoon. And uh, his last name, Sargent, is spelled rather uniquely. It's S-A-R-J-E-A-N-T. So um, I get back to the in-law's house. I pull out the phone book. They had phone books back then. And uh, lo and behold, I find a William A.S. Sargent listed in the phone book. So I phoned him up. I said, hi, Mr. Sargent. My name's Barry. Uh, blah, blah, blah. I told him about myself that I'm a... Uh, uh, a collector of Sherlock Holmes, and he says, oh, that's awesome. He said, would you like to see my collection? Uh, I said, well, absolutely, yes, I would. Uh, so he invited me to his home. Uh, so that afternoon, I I, uh, I went over, and um, he uh, he lived in the, uh, the university area, had this beautiful, beautiful kind of Victorian-era home uh, with a veranda, and oh, it's just gorgeous, and knock on the door and introduce myself and um he uh said well welcome um come on downstairs i'll show you my uh my library I'm going, awesome so we go downstairs i mean it's huge uh and he's got it's it literally is a library he's got shelves and rows and rows and rows you know floor to ceiling of books and I look over on the wall, and it's a original Sydney Paget illustration from the very early, early days of uh, the Holmes publications. Yeah, I pick my jaw up off the floor. I said, "Is that?" He goes, "Yes, yeah, so oh yes, yeah, so that's the original one." And I was like, "Oh my god, <laughs> what?" So. Um, it turns out he had um, uh, the most complete uh, crime uh, and detective uh, fiction library, uh, if not uh, in North America for sure, if not in the world. Uh, just unbelievable. And uh, you know what? I, I spent the afternoon there with him and we looked at all this stuff. And we talked about Sherlock Holmes and, and, uh, and we talked about this book and how much fun he and his uh, friend, uh, Mr. Bradley, had, uh, had writing it and all the controversy they stirred up and irate people they had to deal with. But uh, what, a, what a lovely gentleman. And just imagine, I phoned him up out of the blue from the phone book and he invited me into his home and uh, spent the afternoon sharing. What a, what a very nice man uh, Mr. Sargent was. He, uh, he has since passed away, but uh, I'll never forget that. I asked earlier, who is Sherlock Holmes, fictional character? Uh, well, he was modeled after uh, a real person. Uh, Doyle modeled Holmes, uh, and the character, his methods, uh, some of the mannerisms that he uh, he displayed on one Dr. Joseph Bell, uh, Doyle's uh, one of Doyle's uh, instructors in uh, medical school, uh, and it was the Edinburgh Medical School. Um, in particular, um, what he modeled was you know Holmes's uncanny ability to gather evidence based on observation and deduction. Um, great way to be a detective, I think. Uh, but n nobody had really come up with that method prior to this. Um, you know, 
uh, observation, deductive reasoning, and those were exactly what Bell used in diagnosing a patient's disease. So, you know, uh, Doyle will be sitting in class and, and watching this and uh, thought, hey, you know, that would be uh, that would be good traits for a detective. Uh, and out of all of this came one of, uh, you know, my favorite Sherlock Holmes quotes, which is, once you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. So, um, and oftentimes, you know, it's, I mean... It, we're all baffled by what's going on until Sherlock explains it to us uh, through Watson. And it's like, oh, of course, it's plain. It's it's simple. It's easy, right? Yeah, not until someone <laughs> explains it to you. Um, and, you know, we've all heard the uh, elementary, my dear Watson. Yeah. Holmes never said that. <laughs> it's uh, That is a complete fiction. He did say elementary once but never the uh the fake phrase so um we can talk more about some Holmes quotes uh coming up but uh, i want to show you a book that i found uh that is uh, all about dr joseph bell the man who was sherlock holmes so here it is it's called dr joe bell model for sherlock holmes uh, that is the author's name, Eli M. Libo, published by Popular Press. If you are so inclined to uh, try and track a copy down, I, I don't know if it's still in print or not. I kind of doubt it. Um, I found this copy uh, in Salt Lake City when I bought a big box full of Sherlock Holmes material from a very, very nice bookseller there. So, anyways... We're not going to look at everything, but uh, it's it's easy to see. And uh, Conan Doyle himself gave Bell a lot of credit for the inspiration for Sherlock Holmes, and and openly admitted that uh, he said Holmes's methods are those used by my professor in uh, medical school, Doctor Joseph Bell. So there you go real Sherlock Holmes. So before we run out of time completely, I want to show you some of the books that I have collected um, in my Sherlock Holmes collection. And there's really no um, particular method to it, mostly madness. Uh, just if it's Sherlock Holmes and related, um, I'm always interested in it. I mentioned earlier that, um, you know, there's 56 short stories. And this is one of the first books I read to that summer. Um, and there are four novels. That's it. That's all Doyle wrote uh, himself on Sherlock Holmes. There are uh, literally thousands and thousands and thousands of books. Um, the pastiches, uh, takeoffs, parodies, musicals, movies, TV that are uh, uh, feature Sherlock Holmes and, and John Watson but are not written by Doyle. Um, one of the things I'd, I mentioned, I'd, I'd found that book in uh, in Salt Lake City. I found a, a whole bunch more. So here's some of the uh, books that are written by folks that focus in kind of laser sharp on different aspects of uh, the, the canon, if you will. Uh, pastiche, The Untold Sherlock Holmes. And a lot of these, I am happy to say, are uh, limited signed editions that I have found. So, um, like this one. One of 500 copies. So, they talk about... You wouldn't believe some of the crazy stuff. Um irregular chronology they talk about he this gentleman goes into great detail about the order of the stories what year the month how was that possible this one was not about you know how could that be uh oops so again i'm very happy that i have a copy of this copyright 1947 so this this gentleman talks about 
Come on, focus. All of them. Problems, unresolved problems. So again, uh, this one talks about the use of disguise and crime detection uh, as if it was written by Sherlock Holmes, as we all know. Uh, Holmes was a master of disguise, but he wasn't a woman. Uh, reflections on a scandal in Bohemia. Beautiful. I love these books. So, again, um, and there's, there's oodles of them out there. You could collect for your entire life and you could not get them all. This one is called The Fourth Cab. Um, some writings by Sherlockians, uh, by members of the Speckled Band. Uh, that is one of the uh, Baker Street Irregular Clubs that uh, have been formed around the world off and on over the years. Again, beautiful little copy. This one, uh, A Touch of Class. I can't remember exactly. Yeah, 61 of 221 copies. Um, and it deals with... Oh, cool, look at that, caricatures. The Dreadful Adventures of Charlie Peace, Scott Bond... Uh, Dr. Watson, a physician of mediocre qualifications, question mark. So you can see it's just endless numbers of very cool things that, about Sherlock Holmes. Um, here's one uh, that Sherlock Holmes was a rare book collector by um, a well-known Sherlockian, Madeline B. Stern. The Games Ahead, not afoot. Another uh, another one by Madeline B. Stern. Uh, the resources of Mycroft Holmes, Sherlock's older brother, and a reputedly much much smarter. Mm -hmm. Although Sherlock or uh, Mycroft only appears in two of the stories, and is mentioned in two of the others, but <coughs> excuse me, does play quite a role in kind of the mythology in and around Sherlock Holmes. Here's a, a signed, limited edition, uh, limited edition collectible, uh, the case of the missing Lady Macbeth. And I, I find this stuff kind of wherever I find it, and then I collect it up. One of my, uh, one of my treasures, uh, first edition Hound of the Baskervilles. Um, some claim that it is the most popular ever. Um, I'm looking for a nicer copy someday, maybe when I win the lottery. Look at that. Somebody sold this for two bucks, and they knew it was a first edition. Well, it cost me more than two bucks. I was happy to pay it. Look, there's the original illustrations. Lovely, lovely. Oh, it's such a great book. Um... <clears throat> Arthur Conan Doyle, a memoir by the Reverend John Lamond, an epilogue by Lady Conan Doyle, and look, oh yes, signed by Jean Conan Doyle. This is a uh, this is a treasure as well. Uh, here is one of my favorite pastiches. The Reluctant Agent, a Sherlock Holmes mystery, written by Tracer, Tracy Cooper Posey, who lives in Edmonton. That's right, right here, just like on St. Albert's doorstep. I actually got to meet, uh, meet Tracy um, a few years ago, and uh, at that time I didn't know she had written this. She, I was talking to her about some other books she had written, and these are outstanding. Like I say, uh, you would think... Doyle himself had written these ones. Well done, Tracy. Uh, when I was in England, I had an opportunity to visit the uh, Sherlock Holmes Museum in uh, uh, South Sea. No, where was it? 
When our youngest daughter was uh, living and working in England, we traveled there to visit her and we took a uh, kind of a day trip to Portsmouth, uh, right on the coast. And uh, as I found out, no, I kind of knew before we went, uh, Conan Doyle lived and practiced, uh, that was his first medical practice, I think it was his first, uh, in Portsmouth. Uh, and there was a Sherlock Holmes museum there. So, of course, I went. And here's a couple of the, uh, the items that I found there. So Conan Doyle was quite, uh, quite the athlete, was uh, uh, a, a kind of a world-class cricketer and footballer. So I bought this book, Sherlock Holmes Was a Pompey Keeper. So the extraordinary story of the original Pompey AFC and the world's most famous detective. Funny how you can tie uh, Sherlock into just about darn near anything. So uh, I'd never seen this title and uh, of course I bought it on the spot. Uh, uh, and in that museum... They have a, a study in Sherlock uncovering the author Conan Doyle collection. It was extraordinary. There's just like one of a kind items in there because Doyle, you know, spent a part of his life uh, in there living and, and working, had a practice. So lots of things uh, ended up staying in Portsmouth and uh, they developed this museum. If you ever get a chance, I highly recommend it. Um, another thing I had acquired. Over the years, this is one of my proudest ones, is, that's right, Sir Arthur's signature. And uh, I've had it in this case for, I don't know how long, 15 or 20 years now. Um, I've always thought I, I would make a book plate out of it and put it into uh, one of my Sherlock books, but... I've never had the guts and I could never decide which Sherlock book would be the best one. So now I just take it out and look at it and drool every now and then. Um, I had an opportunity a few years ago to work on this exhibition, the International Exhibition of Sherlock Holmes. And I traveled around uh, North America. It sets up um, here in Edmonton. It was at the TELUS World of Science. And it's uh, fascinating. But it is uh, um, set up like a museum uh, exhibition. So, like museum exhibitions, they're curated and they have professionals that uh, curate them, set them up, run them, and make sure all of the artifacts are uh, safely transported and exhibited. So they needed some help here locally uh, at the TELUS World of Science when the exhibit came in. So each artifact that uh, comes out of packing has to be um, checked over, uh, any damage noted, any changes noted, um, and some of the artifacts are, you know, pretty straightforward, some are not. Uh, and I was lucky enough to, uh, to be able to sit and uh, go through almost each and one of the artifacts that came in for the Sherlock Holmes exhibit and then do it again on the way out. Some of the things I handled were original handwritten manuscript pages by Doyle in his own hand, in his own fountain pen. Uh, for Hound of the Baskervilles and it was uh, as, as the young lady who was in charge kept telling me she's Barry no drooling on the artifacts <laughs> okay just a couple more uh, to look at we could spend literally days going through all of the Sherlock Holmes books that I have but if you have an interest in uh, the works of author Conan Doyle this is the book that you need uh, a bibliography of uh, all of his works uh, and it is thorough, and it's easy to use. And uh, if you are a collector and you want first editions or particular editions, uh, this book will identify those for you. Um, can't recommend it highly enough. Uh, excellent book. Um, here's an interesting one. The Sign of the Four. And it is done in... Greg shorthand. Look at that. The whole book is in shorthand. I have no idea what that says. <laughs> but when I saw it, I had to have it for my collection. Um, another book that I picked up uh, when I was in Salt Lake City was the World Bibliography of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. And it is uh, by DeWall. And uh, one of the... Uh, 
here's a companion volume to this one. Uh, and this is called the International International Sherlock Holmes by Ronald Burt DeWall. And um, there's some uh, interesting letters from Mr. DeWall in here, some newspaper clippings that he had. This was his his uh, cop. No, it was not his copy. Uh, he inscribed this to um, uh, a Sherlockian friend of his, and I was lucky enough. To, uh, to pick this up. Um, I spent a lot of money in that store that day. Um, and it's just amazing. Uh, if you are right into Sherlock, uh, Mr. DeWall's work is uh, invaluable. Um, I think that is just about it, except for uh, I would just want to briefly chat about Vincent Sturette. Um, I picked this one up. It is not Sherlockian related, but as you can see, uh, Mr. Starrett was perhaps the uh, most preeminent Sherlockian of all. Uh, and last winter, uh, went to Cuba for a holiday. I took a paperback version of this copy, The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes. Uh, authored by uh, Vincent Sturette. And I uh, I read it on the beach. Oh, of course, the uh, heater's going to kick in. Yeah, it's minus 15 today. Um, anyways, I read this in Cuba in this mangy little paperback version. And, and I'd, I'd forgotten, to be honest, that uh, this book existed. And it was so good. Uh, and it, it extrapolates the details of uh, Sherlock Holmes' um, his life, what what would he think about this, what would he be done about that uh, it's really a cool, cool book and I thought when I got back home I thought I need to have a hardcover first edition of this so I, I started looking online for uh, a copy of this book and because I really wanted one for my collection and I'm searching and I'm looking and there's, you know, there's copies available online but oh my gosh they were pretty pricey I mean it was published in the 1930s and uh, you know it gets scarcer and scarcer as time goes on and people like me who uh, who collect Sherlock get them in their collections and they keep them so I'm looking away I'm looking away and searching searching and I think to myself hmm I wonder you know what some bell went off I guess and uh, I started searching through these shelves behind me uh, what do I find? Yes, I found this copy. I already owned one. Uh, and what was really cool it's signed by Vincent Sturrett. <laughs> so, you know, maybe um, check through your library now and again to make sure that you have a uh, uh, what you think you have or don't have and uh, save yourself a little time and effort uh, looking for things you already own. So one of the reasons I guess I really uh, I really did enjoy uh, Sherlock Holmes and um, the fact that, that he did uh, appear on all of those uh, various places like Star Trek The Next Generation was that uh, Doyle was really the first um, writer that incorporated scientific methods for his detective to use. And one of the things Doyle had said, uh, I saw in an interview with him one time, was that it, it really kind of pissed him off that so many detective stories at that time, uh, you know, in the 1880s, uh, weren't based on logic that was always, you know, kind of the luck of the draw. Or there was some, you know, mysterious, oh, only the detective knew. And it just, you know, it was, a, it was a little fishy. So, I mean, Doyle depicted Holmes using methods, you know, years before they were adopted by official police forces in uh, Britain and uh, America and Europe. Um, so the result was Sherlock Holmes, who used logic, deduction, and science in his his detection methods and like I said about uh, about Star Trek the next generation uh, he's often quoted by data on Star Trek 
and uh, of course Data's an android and very logical fellow and uh, it resulted in uh, you know more than one Holmes based episode in the series anyways I'm uh, I'm gonna go back over to my Sherlock Holmes shelf and I'm gonna look through see if there's some other books in there that I've forgotten about that I have uh, acquired over the years and uh, just spend a little time with uh, with my favorite uh, fictional character so I'm going to spend a little time in my Sherlock Holmes shelf with my uh, all-time favorite fictional character, get lost in the world of uh, Victorian London with the handsome cabs in the fog and uh, arch uh, enemies and evil guys like uh, Moriarty. Uh, I hope you enjoy whatever it is that you collect in the book world. Uh, it, can bring, uh, it can bring a lot of joy and uh, fun into a person's life. Thanks for watching this episode of Bailey the Bookman, and uh, we'll see you uh, the next time.